please rise? Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Set us free, loving Father from the bondage of our sins, and in your goodness and mercy, give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of the lessons. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 96, found on page 395 in the Book of the Common Prayer. We will read the psalm responsively by half verse. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord, sing unto the Lord and praise his name. 
Declare his honor to the nations. For the Lord is great and highly to be praised. As for all the gods of the nations, they are but idols. Glory and majesty are before him. Ascribe unto the Lord, O ye you families of the peoples. Ascribe unto the Lord the honor due unto his name. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Tell it among the nations, the Lord is king. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The second reading this morning is Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the Thess Thessalonians, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. This is from 1 Thessalonians 1, chapters 1 through 10. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning in our prayers remembering before our God and Father your work of the faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in the power of the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake and you became imitators of us and of the Lord for you receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you into Macedonia and Acacia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel entrance.
The gospel appointed for this morning is from the 22nd chapter of Matthew, verses 15 through 22. This is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they showed him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. It is such a pleasure and a privilege to worship with you all this morning, to worship our God in the beauty of holiness. Before we begin today's sermon, I want to regale you with a story I heard from a fellow deacon from another church who told me about a pastor he knew from his hometown who, when he was preaching, he would go straightway into the Bible passage. No introduction, no story, no illustration. Go straight into the Bible passage and begin explaining and expositing it, expositing it at length, offering comments about the grammar of the passage, about its context within the broader biblical canon. He would tell them about historical and cultural details that were related to the passage in question. And he would go on and on at length, inundating his poor flock with such extensive long lecture that seemed almost like trivial theological points until he would finally pause and ask them, now what's the question? And his congregation, almost relieved, would respond in unison, what's the point? And that and after this, the pastor would then offer several points of practical application based on the information he had just given them. And I begin with this story, brothers and sisters, because as we delve into today's gospel passage, we will be spending some time talking about various historical points of fact that are related to the text. And the point of all this historical analysis, which we're about to engage in, is not to prepare you for some future game of Trivial Pursuit First Century Palestine edition, or for Trivia Night at the Pig and Pint. No, it's my prayer that through these historical and cultural insights, we would come to recognize that we, though we may be 2,000 years and 7,000 miles removed from first century Jerusalem, the world in which our Lord Jesus confronted the Pharisees and chief priests and Herodians just a few days before his crucifixion is not all that different from the world in which we live today. The times may have changed, but the people of God still face very much the same temptations as of old. And today we'll be looking at two of those temptations in particular, two particular temptations today. And what I pray we would see this morning is that as we look to our Lord Jesus and we see how he in his perfect wisdom navigates around the trap that the Pharisees have set, we would also see how our Lord in his response shows us how we are to navigate the temptations we are to face. And it is my prayer that we would see that we as Christians are called to live in the world 
while at the same time remaining wholly devo devoted to our Lord Jesus and his kingdom. We as Christians are called to live in the world while at the same time remaining wholly devoted to Jesus and to his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and ever-living God, we would see Jesus this morning. Speak, O oh Lord, for your servants are listening. We pray in your Son's name. Amen. Just by way of background, um, you're welcome to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. We'll start at Matthew 21 just to get us into our passage for today. And starting at Matthew 21 in the 23rd verse, we see that Jesus, um, just a few days before his crucifixion, his conflict with the Pharisees and chief priests has now reached a new and heightened pitch. These men have antagonized our Lord since the very beginning of his earthly ministry. And now that he has arrived in Jerusalem for the Passover, they have now become more aggressive in their confrontation. And in response to their hostility, our Lord does not hold back. He does not mince words with them. For beginning at Matthew 21, verse 23, we see that the chief priests, as the Lord enters into the temple, question his authority. And in response, he tells them a parable in chapter 21, verse 28, about the parable of the two sons, and he compares them to a faithless and disobedient son who promises his father that he will work the vineyard, but he doesn't. He compares them to wicked and evil tenants who, when the time of harvest had come and their Lord had come to reap the fruits of their harvest, beat, stone, and kill their Lord's servants. And then at last, when the king sends his own son, they kill him likewise, thinking somehow that they would gain from it. He tells them that tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom of God before them. And finally, at last, he warns them in chapter 21, verse 43, that the kingdom of God was soon to be taken away from them and given to a people, producing the kingdom's fruits. Now, as one can imagine, the Pharisees and chief priests do not take kindly to such harsh criticism. And in response, they begin to form a plan to arrest our Lord. But there is one big problem. The crowds, we see that in chapter 21, verse 20, 46. Though they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. We must remember, of course, that the city of Jerusalem is preparing for Passover. And so it is bursting at its very seams as the people of Israel gather from all around to Judea and the surrounding regions in order to commemorate their deliverance from bondage in Egypt. This is the same crowd that just a day or so beforehand had welcomed our Lord with such splendid celebration and delight. And it will be the same crowd that a few days after will be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Now these people, the Pharisees know, perceive Jesus to be a prophet. And if they're not careful with how they deal with him, then this overcrowded city will be the epicenter of a massive riot. And they may, well, not only lose their social standing, which they valued so much, but also their very lives in the process. Mobs can get very ugly. And so they begin to scheme and to plot. And in their scheming, they form an unlikely alliance with the Herodians. Now, the term Herodian, unless I am mistaken, is unique to the New Testament. It's not found in any other source. And because of this, it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly who they were. Some suggest that they were some sort of political party. Others suggest that they were members of the court of Herod Antipas, or even one of some of his soldiers. And Herod Antipas, mind you, is the king who ruled over Galilee, and he was the same one who ordered the death of John the Baptist in Matthew 14. But irregardless of who they were exactly, we can gather from their name that they were a group who supported um, the descendants of Herod the Great, that terrible Edomite dictator who ruled Israel from 37 to 4 BC, and wanted to see his children and his grandchildren rule over all Judea once again. Now, at this time, there were some, some of Herod's children did rule certain regions, but Jerusalem was ruled directly by Rome. And that is because a few decades back, um, Herod Archelaus, one of Herod's sons, had gotten into trouble with Rome, and so they 
kicked him out, and they put their own governor in place, the current governor being, of course, Pontius Pilate. Now, this in mind, the political and religious ideals of the Herodians are actually almost exactly the opposite of the Pharisees. For you see, the Pharisees wanted to see the Messiah of Israel return and to rule over Israel, to destroy evil Rome, to destroy all of God's enemies. And this is what motivated their rigorous, harsh, and unrelenting pursuit of the law. Because as far as the Pharisees are concerned, whenever they see somebody who uh, is a sinner in their eyes, they see them as the problem. They see them as it is their fault, that is, it's because of their sin, the Messiah is not coming. It is because of them, the Messiah hasn't come to destroy our enemies and to bring the kingdom of God again. The Herodians, on the other hand, were a people who had adopted much of the ways and the customs and values of the Roman Empire. They had assimilated the culture of Rome into their beliefs. And now, while they may not have wanted big government of Rome to control them directly, perhaps some of us can sympathize with that, they still very much enjoyed the comforts and luxuries that Roman society and Roman values had brought to their way of life. Like the Romans, they valued wealth, they valued power, and they valued pleasure. But yet, despite their differences, these two opposing parties find a common enemy in our Lord Jesus Christ. For the Pharisees, Jesus is a blasphemer who will lead people away from God's law and thus further delay the arrival of the Messiah and the restoration of the kingdom. For the Herodians, Jesus was just another in a long line of zealots, fanatics, and revolutionaries who would do nothing but tighten Rome's control directly over the region. So now, what's the question? What's the point? Why am I spending so much time talking about Herodians and Roman government, what does that have to do with us today? Because in these two persons, namely the Pharisees and the Herodians, we see the two temptations that have plagued Christians since the beginning of the church. Two temptations. One, the temptation to adopt a strict religious pride and triumphalism that would lead us to isolate ourselves from society and to reject the world and all of those who live in it. And two, to embrace the world, along with its values, its interests, and its convictions. First off, there is the way of the Pharisees. There is the way of religious triumphalism. This is the temptation to retreat from the world. This temptation is perhaps even greater for us in the South, a place where the vast majority of folks are at least nominally Christian, Christian on the surface. They at least enjoy Christian society, they at least enjoy sort of the pleasures of good old southern living. And so because of this, there's a great temptation to live isolated within the four walls of our churches and within the walls of our well-curated circle of Christian friends and neighbors. And we do not have to try very hard, brothers and sisters, to spend our lives in these wonderful communities and never once have to encounter somebody who doesn't know our Lord. We never have to encounter a non-believer. We never have to encounter anybody outside our circle. And we may be tempted from this position to abandon and ignore the larger community, to see our fallen post-Christian world as nothing more than a lost cause, to be able to say within our churches, it's their problem. It's their problem. It's all going to pot, but at least we've got our little community here. Now, brothers and sisters, in saying this, I do not mean in any way to belittle our very real need for community. In fact, in order to be able to endure the trials and temptations of this fallen world, we desperately need to be in community with each other. But as we gather in friendship and in discipleship and in prayer, let's not forget that the purpose of our gathering together is so that we can then be sent out. Remember the prayer that many of us pray. When we come here to Holy Trinity on Sundays, we pray after the Eucharist. Now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. Witnesses. The great commission, as one of my professors used to say, is not the great omission. It's not optional. We are to be living witnesses of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to avoid this temptation towards sort of isolated community living that stands in pride and in judgment against the world. I mean, a case in point, I'll bring up an example. The late Nabil Qureshi, he was an evangelical minister. 
He was a convert from Islam, and he spent his life reaching out to the lost, and he would give lectures on how we as Christians ought to engage with our Muslim neighbors. And he tells this story about a Saudi Arabian uh, grad student. He came for a couple of years to the United States to attend grad school. And he brought with him two suitcases, big suitcases full of gifts, because he anticipated being invited over to people's homes and then to give them gifts in appreciation for their hospitality. Two years in the United States, two years in Christian America, in Southern polite society, he went back with two suitcases full. Not a single person invited him into their home. We must beware the temptation of the Pharisees. Now there is a second temptation, and that is to modify and to accommodate our beliefs and way of life so that it corresponds to the values of the surrounding culture. This is to fall in the way of so many churches who take their cues from the current cultural, philosophical, and societal trends rather than from the eternal word of God. And while we might be able to stand with pride and to say, well, we are evangelicals, we are people who profess scripture to be the foundation and source of all that we think and do, yet we ourselves can also be too easily deceived and in also subtle ways adopt a worldly perspective and worldly values. Um, a few years ago, the campus ministry Veritas Forum asked N.T. Wright to give a lecture at Northwestern University entitled, What Gods Do We Believe in Today? And I will not give you that entire lecture right now, but in summation, this is what N.T. Wright says. He says, in essence, the gods we believe in are the same gods the Romans believed in. They're no different. As the modern world sought to liberate human society from the constraints of religious belief, to unshackle us from, you know, some angry god up in the heavens, all those ancient gods, particularly Mars, Mammon, and Aphrodite, crept back into public life unseen. Modern people, in other words, worship the same gods, the gods of power, the gods of wealth, the gods of pleasure. And the only difference is that ancient pagans had the sense to openly acknowledge what they worshipped, to build temples and idols to their gods, and to make their worship an integral part of their everyday life. Whereas the modern person goes about assuming he is free, but yet in, the, in his heart bows down before the idols of old. And if we are not careful, brothers and sisters, these same idols can infect us. I mean, think about it. We are surrounded by a culture that uh, is filled with stories and narratives, especially as we come upon this election year and as we see the two parties hash it out. We see two very large and very different perspectives on how we ought to live our daily lives. And then in the midst of those stories are even smaller stories. And if we're not careful, it would be very easy for us to assimilate into one or another narrative for our lives. And so likewise, also, in between the commercials, as we watch the politicians debate, we can see the commercials which tell us, buy this new product. You know, your life is not quite fully fulfilled, but here, if you buy this wonderful shampoo, everything will be great. Everything will be wonderful. So, what about us, brothers and sisters? In what ways do we offer worship to the ancient gods? Martin Luther, herald of the Protestant Reformation, reminds us in his small catechism that in order to obey that first commandment, it means that we should fear, love, and trust God above all things. Likewise, Calvin, on the other side of the Reformation, in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, states, what is idolatry if not this? To worship the gifts in place of the giver himself. For after all, I mean, there's nothing wrong with nice things. There's nothing wrong with many of the good gifts that we receive in this life, but the problem with idolatry is when we come to trust those things more than the giver of those good things, God himself. So I ask you to think to yourself, what is it that we fear? What is it that we truly love? And in what do we truly trust? Let us beware the temptation of the Herodians. And so we turn to the trap the trap that the Pharisees and the Herodians send, uh, send out to Jesus. The Pharisees send their disciples in chapter 22, verse 16. Keep in mind, it's not actually the Pharisees going out. They send their disciples. 
It's probably because by now Jesus recognizes them pretty well. He's just said some really mean words and harsh words to them earlier. And you can almost imagine this college intern sort of person gladly taking this assignment to beat this terrible heretic. And so they get their disciples along with the Herodians, and these disciples say, Teacher, we know that you're true and that you teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. What buttery, buttery language, what pomp, what rhetoric. You can see that college intern just being so excited. <laughs> Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And so the trap is this. If Jesus says, no, we should not pay the tax, then the Herodians can warn the Roman authorities and he can be indicted with, uh, you know, insurrection and be taken off to trial, killed off. That's the end of the day. And on the other hand, though, if he says, yes, pay the tax, then the Pharisees can go around saying, hey, this great leader you love, he loves the Romans. He tells you to pay their taxes. And their hope is that they would take the fire out of this love that the people have for this man, Jesus Christ. But na Jesus navigates the third way. And today he calls us to follow after him. Let us listen to his response. Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said Caesar's. And he says to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. Jesus navigates a third way. He calls us, brothers and sisters, to live in the world, not to retreat from it in self-righteous judgment, not to isolate ourselves from it, but at the same time calls us to not succumb to the world's vision for human life and prosperity. We render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And yes, that does include paying our taxes. But at the same time, we do so according to God's word and God's will and purpose for our lives. You know, one of the things that has always inspired me in seeing, hearing stories of great Christians of old um, is their ability to truly love the people that they're surrounded by, to truly care for their neighbor, while at the same time they seem like strangers in the land. You can tell that there's, they're almost out of place, almost. Like they're sojourners passing through a foreign country looking for their home. That is the Christian life, brothers and sisters. We are reminded that though we are called to be faithful in what we've been given, this is not our home. Our home is coming. Our home is coming. Our Lord is coming back. As I was working on this sermon, I was trying to think of a historical example, and then I just thought to myself, well, let's take a look back. If you're running out of examples, you can always look at the Bible. A great example of this kind of walking, walking in the world but not of it is none other than Daniel himself. If you recall Daniel's story, he was one of those taken from Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had finally besieged Jerusalem, taking it down, torn down the temple, and he takes Daniel and his companions away. But because he is young, because he is smart, he the king Nebuchadnezzar trains him up, makes him one of the officials in his courts, trains them in their language, trains them in their law. But Daniel doesn't shirk this opportunity. He could, have found, he could have tried to find many ways to escape, but rather he obeyed those words that we find in Jeremiah 29, 7, Seek the welfare of the city you are in. Not only did he serve well in the court, but he did so well that when the, Babylonians, uh, when the Babylonian Empire fell and the Persian Empire rose up, the king Darius um, makes him one of the top officials in his court. But this courts the attention, and of course, when you're dealing with kingdoms and politics of some sort and you rise to a higher position people want to take that position from you and so other folks other officials jealous of daniel's position set a trap and the trap is this they come to king darius and say 
O King Darius, live forever. Make a decree that for 30 days no one can worship any other god or make any petition to God or any man except for you. And Daniel, knowing this trap very full well, doesn't shirk away from the worship of his Lord. But instead, instead he continues in his daily habit of prayer three times a day. He is caught, he is arrested, he is thrown into the lion's den. And we know the rest of the story. If we grew up in Sunday school, Daniel in the lion's den, God protects Daniel. But here in that example, we have somebody who is serving God faithfully in his position in life, in his standing in life, but yet standing for a completely set of different values, heavenly values, kingdom of God values. So now how are we to navigate this balance of living in the world while also remaining devoted to God? Well, the first step is scripture. Because for us, God's word cannot just be a simple guide or rule of, rule of life. It can't be just a reference book that we pick up every now and then, glean a few points, close it up, put it back on our shelf. No, it needs to be the very framework, the very lens through which we see all of life. Because as I was saying before, we are surrounded by stories. We are surrounded by people telling us who we are, what we are to think, what we ought to buy. All such. And in order to combat those narratives, we need to be immersed in the great narrative of biblical history, in that great gospel story of God's redemptive love for his people, who sent, he who sent his only begotten son to die on our behalf and raised him up so that we too might die to sin and be raised to newness of life. We must be immersed in the scriptures. It must be the lens through which we see all of reality. As C.S. Lewis once put, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the sun, not because I see it, but through it, I see everything else. Second, prayer. Cultivating a habit of daily prayer prevents us from walking in the way of the Herodians and taking the goods and pleasures of this life and seeing them as ends within themselves, as things we ought to strive for wholeheartedly, without any other, with, without any other rule in our life, without God's will and purpose in our lives. So it is the constant temptation to take these goods of the world, these good things of creation, and to place them at the center of our lives. But if we cultivate a daily habit of prayer, as we offer to God our thanks for these good things, and we seek his will and his direction for our lives, thereby, thereby staving off that temptation to see goods as ends in themselves and to follow in that path of the Herodians. And if you want a good start, brothers and sisters, those of us here at Holy Trinity Anglican Church, I mean, our tradition has a book. It can tell you to help, help you out in terms of cultivating that daily habit of prayer, what, however that daily habit of prayer looks for you. And finally, community. Christ did not mince words. The great commission is not the great omission. He, send us, he told us to go forth and make disciples of all nations. And this means being intentional about forming genuine relationships with those outside of our Christian faith. It means being actively engaged in our uh, local community, however that service, however that engagement might look. And for some of us, and this includes me, this means stepping out of our comfort zone. But we also, and in so much as we need to develop community outside, we desperately need to be intentional about our fellowship with one another. We are members of the body of Christ, and we need one another for strength and encouragement as we go forth to love and serve the Lord in the midst of this world. And here especially today as we gather together to hear God's word preached, and as we are soon to partake of the Lord's table, Lord, uh, we are here strengthened. We are reminded at God's table that we are very members one another of the body of Christ. And God himself, our Lord, strengthens us to go out into the world, to love and serve him with gladness and singleness of heart. And so this day, as you come to the table, um, think about the ways we can better engage our community, how we can better love the Lord, how we can navigate the, this, this strange life that we live, rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, being faithful 
in our communities, but at the same time rendering to God the things that are God's. And what do we owe to God? Everything. Everything. Amen. Let us stand, and in response to the preaching of God's Word, let us confess our common faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This is the appointed time in our service for we, the people of God, to come before us, heavenly throne, with our prayers of intercession and thanksgiving. So I invite you to join with me, either silently or aloud. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, for all ministers, for Foley, our Archbishop, and Frank, our Assisting Bishop, for Ryan, Bubba, Jimmy, and Chris, our parish clergy, for David and Lee, our music ministers, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Let us pray to the Lord, and we especially lift up St. Luke Orthodox Anglican Church in Sakiston, Missouri. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Let us pray to the Lord. We thank you for our life group leaders, our prayer team leaders and small Bible study group facilitators. Lord, in your mercy. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith at home and abroad, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. For our nation, for those in authority, from all 
in public service, especially Donald, our president, and Tate, our governor, for the members of the U.S. Congress, for local mayors and council persons. Let us pray to the Lord. Lift up especially the upcoming national and local elections, for the issues also presented to the voters. May the Lord's people be chosen and his will be done. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any adversity, especially those on Holy Trinity's prayer list, let us pray to the Lord. Pray for all those who are ravaged by COVID-19. We pray for protection for our families, for our church family, for this nation, for the world. We beg the Lord for mercy. We ask him to heal our land. Pray for wise judgment for the peoples of this world to exercise caution and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who are departed in this life and the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for rising to life again, in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your spirit, that we may know him and make him known, and through him at all times and all places may give thanks to you in all things. Are there other thanksgivings? We give thanks for the ladies of Crossroad Ministries. We give thanks for many of them being with us today. We thank you for the people that volunteer and witness to these ladies, what it means to be 
a believer, a follower in Christ. We pray that these ladies will know that they are beautifully and wonderfully created. We ask your abundant blessing upon them this day and for the rest of their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to Him. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Please rise. And now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, good morning. Good morning and, and God's peace to you. Welcome to Holy Trinity. Just a few announcements today. First of all, we want to welcome the, the Crossroads girl. We're so thankful that you're here with us today. So we hope that you'll come back and join us. Secondly, we, we have... Um, these bulletins, you probably saw them on your way in. They're on the table there. So we've restored the bulletins and um, just they'll be there for now on. So you can follow along with these or you can use the book. But the uh, scripture lessons are in here as well. The whole service is in here. The liturgy, the scripture, everything. So uh, please look for those on Sunday mornings, both the 8 o'clock a.m. service and the 10 uh, service. Richard Aiken called this morning, and, and it is in the, in the announcements here. To, we're going to have a, a golf, they tell me it's called a, a scramble or something. A, a golf scramble. I, would, I like the idea of it because I would be in last place, but I would get the points of whoever the best golfer was, I guess. Anyways, it's going to be on October the 22nd at 2 p.m. at the Canton Country Club. And it's for men and women 
as I said, of all skill levels, all, so even they would let me come to that. Um, bring your own clubs, but there is an $18 cart fee. Uh, so if you're interested in that or you want to know more, contact Richard Aiken or Bob Winstead. Both of their numbers are in the bulletin there. In fact, I think they want you to call them even if you're, if you're planning on attending so they can get a head count. So if you're planning on attending that, call either Richard or Bob. Jimmy, do you have a... It's really on my behalf, but he has the information. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Jimmy. I, um, I figured if he said, uh, bring your chainsaw, if you have it, that would get some of the Fellas excited because there are plenty of things to, to cut down with a chainsaw, so <laughs> lots of stuff. If you've come with a specific burden on your heart, or if the Lord has, has laid a burden on your heart during this, the course of the service, I want to invite you to go through these double doors here. There will be a prayer team uh, to greet you and, and pray with you, whatever it may be. So please avail yourself of the prayer team. Um, finally, just a reminder that this is the Lord's table. This is not Holy Trinity's table. And all Christians who are baptized in the name of the Trinity are warmly welcome to take communion with us. If you're not prepared to take communion right now, or if you've not been baptized, just come up and, and cross your arms and we'll be happy to have a blessing for you or a prayer. So walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By His resurrection, He broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under His feet. As our great High Priest, He ascended to Your right hand in glory that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night He was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and gave it to His disciples saying, Take, eat. This is My body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with Him, that He may dwell in us, and we in Him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by Him and with Him and in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are very bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness but in your abundant and great mercies, 
We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Beloved Christians, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on Him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now may the cross of the Son of God, who is mightier than all the hosts of Satan, and more glorious than all the angels of heaven, abide with you in your going out and your coming in, by day and by night, at morning and at evening, at all times and in all places. May it protect you from the wrath of evil persons, from the assaults of evil spirits, from foes invisible, from the snares of the evil one, and from all low passions that beguile the soul and the body. May the cross of Jesus protect and deliver you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.